everybody. And welcome to this webinar. My name is Mike Shanahan and I'm moderating this event. The webinar has been organized by the Earth Journalism Network or EJN, which is a program of Internews, a global media development organization. EJN's mission is to improve the quality and quantity of media coverage of our environment. Through grants, training and other activities, it supports journalists around the world to report on climate change, biodiversity and conservation, pollution and other issues. EJN is also a community of about 13,000 journalists in 180 countries. If you're not a member already and you would like to be, please visit earthjournalism.net to register. And by registering, you will receive news about webinars like this, as well as other events and opportunities for funding and fellowships. Today's webinar is part of EJN's Biodiversity Media Initiative, which is a three-year project that you can read all about on EJN's website. And today's topic is the new global framework for protecting nature and all of the benefits it brings us, which is being negotiated under the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD. And I'm very pleased to welcome one of the two co-chairs of the process that developed the first draft of that global biodiversity framework, Basile Van Arbre. Thank you very much for joining us today, Basile. The first draft was published just this week and Basile is going to give us a presentation of what's in it and following that there'll be some time for some questions and answers. So if you're watching this live and there's something that you would like to ask, please use the Q&A feature instead of the chat box and we will try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Now before I hand over to Basile, I just want to give a quick overview of how we got here and introduce a few terms and concepts. First, the CBD, or the Convention on Biological Diversity. This is an international treaty that was adopted at the Earth Summit in Rio in Brazil in 1992. It aims to promote the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and ensure that the benefits arising from the use of genetic resources are shared fairly and equitably. Most countries and the European Union are parties to the CBD. The United States notably is not. In 2010, the parties to the convention agreed a set of 20 targets called the Aichi targets, named after a prefecture of Japan where their meeting took place. However, by the 2020 deadline, none of those targets had been fully met. Meanwhile, the situation for biodiversity has grown ever more grave. In 2019, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services reported that the unprecedented rate of biodiversity loss threatens human well being and that 1 million species are at risk of extinction. The last term I want to introduce quickly is COP15. This is the short name for the forthcoming 15th Conference of Parties to the Convention on Bio Biological Diversity. This is the meeting at which the new global biodiversity framework is due to be finalized and adopted. COP15 was originally scheduled for late 2020 in Kunming in China, but it's been delayed because of the pandemic. Basil, I hope that summary is okay by way of introduction. Um, you now have the floor, so please go ahead with your, with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and uh, good day to all of you. Mike, if you, can you hear me well? Yes, you're loud and clear. Okay, excellent. Uh, good day to all of you. It's a pleasure to, to join you and be able to, to present our work. In a second, I'll be sharing my screen and we'll go through a, a presentation but uh, Mike did an excellent presentation of the context and some of the terminology. And, and uh, let's, uh, let's get into, into screen sharing now. And it will take a second. And then you'll be able to see my screen. Uh, Mike, can you see it? Yes. Yes, I can, yes. Okay, all right, so, so let's get going. Um, what uh, we want to present you today is where we're coming from, and here you see you see uh, uh, on the on the left a graph that has been picked up from uh, an assessment of nature that has been done by the International Panel on Biodiversity and, and Ecosystem Service. So that's the equivalent on the biodiversity side of the IPCC on the climate side, and then what they are telling us is is that uh, the key drivers of biodiversity loss are land and sea use change, direct exploitation, climate change, pollution, 
invasive alien species. And you see that the, the sharing of those uh, various cars change a little bit from one uh, area or one ecosystem to the other. But in behind that, there is a number of indirect drivers. Um, what does that mean is that uh, we're losing large amount of ecosystem, fish stocks are being depleted, uh, climate change is exerting a pressure in, and also in term and loss of nature is, is, is uh, increasing the, the cause of climate change. We're seeing a lot more invisible in species and, and we're seeing plastic waste increase. So definitely uh, a phenomenon and a crisis that, that is catching the attention, not only of the general public, but all sphere of society, including government, finance ministers and business. Where we are in the, in the, in the process, and, and uh, Mike was talking about the HE target. Uh, so the, the Convention on Biological Diversity works on 10 year cycle. So the previous cycle is the HE cycle, and now we're preparing for the next one. The mandate we got is uh, to prepare a first uh, uh, draft that was published in January 2020. And we had a meeting, then we, we made a, a relatively limited update uh, last summer. And this is now a major update of the text uh, based on, on the scientific and technical advice we got from the advice on the Committee on Implementation. All in all, we got about 2,000 different comments and 700 pages, and, and our team of uh, policy analysts and, and, and others have been working in, in helping us and prepare summaries that we used in the process. To give you an idea, is we, we've, we've spent uh, with co-chair and technical advisor from the Secretary more than 50 hours in web conference, including a terrible one that lasted for all of nine hours with a few five minutes breaks. Um, Moving on to the, the process itself, um, I don't want to go into great detail, but uh, I am an engineer by training, so I like to have flow charts and arrows and boxes. Uh, so we went through a fairly elaborate process of regional consultation, thematic consultation, and, and now we're in the tail end of the process with uh, uh, the, the work on what we call the open-ended working group, which is the, the, the key negotiating body that will start to meet online in August and will continue to meet in person later and then will eventually go to the COP. Um, in terms of the major points, what we're trying to do is to structure the document in a way where we get goals that define that lofty vision of ours in measurable terms. We'll have milestones that step down those goals to the 2030 uh, time horizon and then targets that, that really focus on the action. So goals and milestones are about status of things and targets are around action that makes change. You will see that the text in, in draft one is a full and complete text. There is no X and Y, there is no alternative. We felt that was the best way to elicit the right conversation. And then you will see that we've, we've now put in numerical aspect everywhere we felt it was appropriate. And all those aspects are based on, on solid scientific advice on, on solid financial studies. Um, probably a, a very important part of the, of the system is understanding what we call a theory of change, which is kind of the logical flow. So we're in a current state where we, are, we have a loss of biodiversity. We want to get to that better state on, on, the, on the right side, which is the vision. And then really what counts is in the middle which is about what action are we going to take? And that's, that's the box called mission, means of implementation, tools, reducing threats and meeting people needs. And, and what has, is that going to make a difference in terms of milestones and goals? Let's now dive into the, the substance of the, the, the goals. And you see there on this graphic, on the left, the wording that we use on the, on the goals and, and the corresponding milestones. The, the first one is very uh, long because it, it, it includes a number of aspects about the integrity of ecosystem, all ecosystems. So both natural ecosystem, but also those that are pro providing value, but maybe modified like uh, farmlands, pastures, et cetera. Also talking about species, both in terms of the rate of extinction that is uh, divided by 10 and the risk of extinction, but also finally on genetic diversity. 
Um, I won't go into the detail of the milestone. They're basically stepping stone on the way to that goals with uh, a kind of interim, interim uh, numerical targets. B, B is on the uh, contribution that uh, to people well-being, and we're talking about how we're going to be valuing uh, in numerical term that contribution, and and how this is going to be accounted and secured for the long term. C is around the third goal of the convention, which is around the sharing of the benefit from the utilization of genetic resources, both monetary and non-monetary. And then finally, um, words under D seem pretty innocuous, but in fact carry a lot of weight, which is around how are we going to be making financial tool and finance work under that context? So you'll see that practically this means closing the gap progressively up to uh, $700 billion by year 2030. And I'll explain how that works. And then also making sure that there is finance ready for the next decade uh, by the end. Now moving on to the, the first group of targets, which is addressing the direct drivers of biodiversity loss. And you see that on the left, the five drivers that I mentioned earlier. Target one is around, uh, actually target one, two, and three are about land and sea area. And then the first one is around uh, how we were using and, and land use planning, considering biodiversity, and as well as retaining existing and wild area. Two is around restoration of ecosystem, and three is the famous 30% protection and conservation. Four is, is a bit of a catch-all uh, target for all the other actions that are taken by, by um, uh, us uh, around the world for species conservation, including human wildlife conflicts. Five is making sure that harvest, trade, and use is sustainable, legal, and safe for human being. Six is the ever increasing area of invasive alien species with a numerical targets on uh, reducing the rate of introduction and establishment by 50%. Seven will undoubtedly gather quite a bit of attention. It is a focus of pollution with a focus on the three top substances identified by scientific experts, namely um, nutrient loss to the environment, pesticides, and plastic with uh, uh, reducing nutrient loss in half pesticide by two thirds and eliminating plastic discharge. And, and finally, another one that would gather quite a bit of attention too is around climate change. So there is kind of a dual relationship between climate change and nature. Um, nature is impacted by climate change in a, in a major way. That's one of the top drivers of biodiversity loss, but nature can also be an important source of the mitigation and adaptation solution. So we try to, to um, to capture those two aspects in the target. And first, in terms of the contribution of nature to the mitigation adaptation efforts. And experts are telling us that somewhere between 30 and 37% of the needs can be met by nature-based solution. We felt that it was not appropriate to use a percentage point because we cannot control what is happening on the rest of the equation that is within the purview of the UNFCCC. So are suggesting it would be more appropriate to have an absolute number in terms of gigatons of CO2 e emission. And, and starting from the numbers identified within the UN system, we came down to about 10 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. That could be the contribution of nature to the mitigation adaptation efforts. So that's one half. The other half is, is what, uh, what uh, the climate change people are doing it and what we're requesting. Basically, that's a request to the UNFCCC is that adaptation effort avoid negative impact on, on uh, biodiversity. Concrete example, uh, some people are looking at plantation of forest uh, to address uh, carbon issues. If you choose the right species, this is a great idea. But if you're choosing monoculture of alien species, some like uh, eucalyptus in some cases, that can be uh, very damaging to the environment. So that's the first group. The second group is around how nature is contributing to people's needs. And that's very important, starting with contribution of food, medicine is livelihood in terms of harvesting of species, including fishery. And, and, and we need to understand and make sure that this is done in a sustainable way, but also meet the need of the people. We're gonna be adding half a billion people on, on the earth over the next uh, 
uh, decade and, and those people will need to be fed, uh, closed and protected. Number 10 is around how we use ecosystem with uh, agriculture, aquaculture, forestry, and, and making sure that uh, we're, we're sustainable in that and we have some resilience. You will see the notion of productivity here. We've been debating that at length. Uh, and that's the notion if we have a productive agriculture, you can reduce the, the, the use of land for that particular activity. So there is the right balance between having within the context of a sustainable activity, having as much productivity as you can to decrease the footprint. 11, <coughs> 11 is around the other part of the um, the equation in terms of uh, regulation services, provision of quality of air, water protection. 12 is access and, and availability of green and blue space close to where people live, including in the urban area. And 13 in terms of uh, measuring uh, uh, the uh, uh, benefit sharing and access to genetic resources. Now turning to the next uh, page, which is the, the uh, area around, around the supporting activities, there are lots of very important uh, uh, targets there. 14 is, is how we factor biodiversity in decision-making in government, mainly in regulation, planning, use of uh, environmental assessment, and, and in national accounts. So how do we account for this wealth that we have, or we may not have, or we're losing? in terms of uh, biodiversity and ensuring that all activities, including financial flow, and we're talking here about private sector finance are factored in. 15 is, is uh, focusing on economic activities and business and how they're run uh, and how their impact is, uh, is decreased, how we're factoring risk in, in there, including from uh, industries like extractive industries uh, and supply chain and, and talking about uh, circular economy. 16 in the end is as you and I and all of us in this call and anywhere are making choice on every day we make choice on what we purchase or not, how we get to, to somewhere and ensuring that we have in the information and the alternative available. 17 is on the negative impact of biotechnology. 18 and 19 are very important. 18 is about reducing negative incentive and subsidies. For example, a number of countries are subsidizing the, the fuel of their fishing fleet. And, and just removing that incentive may decrease the fishing efforts and then maybe increasing the sustainability of fishery. So, this is not so much about, this target is not about increasing uh, the resource available, it's about decreasing the cost and bringing that, that uh, need for uh, remedial action down. The OECD number estimates that uh, uh, negative incentive uh, for just uh, agriculture and energy amount to $700 billion. So $500 billion seems like a huge number, but it's actually uh, quite realistic. 19 is the other side of the equation. So now that we've brought down the, the cost, we need also to increase the amount of resource available. And, and uh, the Ang Paulson Institute uh, study showed that we could be increasing spend, you know, the resource available for conservation up to $200 billion per year. Uh, estimate of current spending are somewhere between 140 and 170. So again, uh, look like a big number, but in fact, it, uh, it is totally doable. What is important is within that 200 billion number, there is a need to increase financial flow to developing countries by $10 billion. So that's a, a very important part of the equation. Let's have a, a, an ambitious framework, but a framework that is also equally ambitious in terms of the resource available. 20 is on, uh, on the availability of information, science, including traditional knowledge. And then 21 on the participation of a number of groups, including indigenous people, local communities, and we're using their language directly lifted from the UN Declaration on the Right of Indigenous People, as well as women and girls and youths. Um, in addition, and I'll go pretty quickly, uh, there is a number of other sections uh, in the document that talked about uh, implementation supports, enabling condition, how we're gonna have that planning reporting and, and, uh, and review system and outreach. Um, 
wanna wanna show you now um, the uh, how this all worked together. And it's a bit of a uh, starting from the center where you get living in harmony with nature. Um, as we are adding around it, the expression of that in terms of the goals, the four goals that are 2050, bringing that uh, down to the um, level of the milestone in 2030. To get to that, you need to get in all of those 13 action. And it is not a restaurant menu where you pick the one you like the most and you make your meal. It, it is a whole, and that's what we're trying to show with that cycle is that in order to get to any one of those milestones or goals, you need the, the 13 action. So getting to the ecosystem you want is, is equally a result of land use, of pollution, of harvest management, but also how you manage, how people are using that landscape. And that is done with the support of those target 14 to 21, which is around the needs and how you're gonna be mainstreaming that and in the context of, uh, of uh, enabling condition. So uh, Mike, I'm, I'm getting to the, the, the last slide of my presentation. I know I've been going very, very quick, but I hope I've not been going for too long. Back to you. Thank you very much, Basile. It's, uh, it's an immense amount of work. And uh, if anyone's looked at the document yet themselves, they'll see it's somehow you've managed to condense it all into just about 10 or so pages so i encourage everyone to download the documents i've put a link in the chat so you can find uh the the draft text in all of the un languages so, so just to summarize basil uh, there are four overall goals for 2050 and these four goals relate to four areas broadly conservation use of biodiversity benefit sharing and finance then there are 10 milestones to be achieved by 2030 and 21 actions, targets for action that are needed to reach those milestones firstly in 2030 and ensure that we're on track for reaching the overall goal in 2050. Is that more or less uh, okay? That's a very good description. You're doing it better than me. <laughs> I've been reading it all night. <laughs> um, so before we get onto the content, I'd like to ask a little bit about the process and specifically what happens next. You've got uh, more negotiations in August, is that right? That's that's correct. So basically what, uh, what we know is that uh, we get uh, two more weeks of, uh, of online work to be done in, in August, and that's going to be kind of a an exploration of what I showed you and, and an opportunity for the parties to express their views. Uh, we'll see how far we can go in two weeks. Uh, working online is not easy. What, what we also know is that we're going to need some face-to-face -face work. And I'm, um, I'm confident there will be announcement very, very soon about the format of, of that. So um, the pandemics has played the trick on us in, in uh, many respects, uh, and, and I think we're trying to find the right balance between the need to move urgently to address those issues, but also not too fast to allow everybody to, to be on board. So a document is only a document, what counts is the action, and that's why we need everybody engaged. At the Guardian newspaper reported this week that the COP15 meeting is likely to be postponed again until the first half of next year. Is, is, can you give us any updates on when the COP will take place? Is it so so um, I can, what I can tell you is that we had a meeting yesterday and, and we have a plan, decision were made and, and uh, the host is China and they will be making those announcements very, very soon. And, and I'm satisfied that we're going to have uh, enough time to conduct face-to-face -face negotiation in, in a rapid way, but in a way that enable us to get to good results. So I'm kind of dancing around the issue because I don't want to trump the... Uh, but if you go on social media, I know that uh, some people are very well informed. Okay, good tip. Um, and as the, as the meeting was originally planned for late 2020, and now it's either going to happen in late 2021 or it's going to happen in early 2022, that, that means we've already lost between 10 and 15% of the time needed to meet, meet those 10 milestones by 2030. So does the deadline need to change? That's a good question. And, and, and uh, if you read carefully uh, the framework, there is a footnote to that effect in the framework at the beginning. And, and uh, we purposely made that uh, not too prominent footnote, but there is a need to, to review. And, and some people I've been asking uh, ourselves the question, like, 
do we are we happy with that eight years time frame? Should we look at ten years? Should we look at the the whole time to 2050 and cut it differently in two in two bit one 15 year each? So everything is on the table. I think it's a very valid question to ask. My sense is that it's probably not a top subject for discussion in August. Like we're, we need to, to look at the, the practical, but in the time frame between August and, and January, we should have a conversation about that. Okay. So the, the draft text has 21 targets and 10 milestones. It, it sounds very similar to what we had back in 2010 with the IHE targets. So what is different this time? Several things. For, so, so um, I think the 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 structure is one where it's very different. So you had a, a very rigid a goal, a certain number of targets, a goal, a certain number of targets that were directly associated with it. We're moving away from that, and that's why I was so keen to show you that circular structure where every target is contributing to every goal. That's one change. The second one is that we're trying to word, we were asked to word the targets and, and set targets in a way that is ambitious and realistic, not aspirational. So there was a lot of those aspirational targets in the HE system. And that means that when they're aspirational, there is very little change you're gonna reach them. So what we're trying to do different here is to have those realistic targets that can be reached and then it's going to be very important for, for the system, government, multilateral organization to say, okay, we're asking you citizens and governments to put a fair amount of money on the table. Here's what we can deliver and showing that we actually can deliver. So that's the second aspect. And then finally, uh, one of the most well-known HE targets is, was target 11 around the uh, famous 17% uh, protected and conserved area. And we learned from that that numerical targets works. And that's why you're seeing number around many, as many aspects as we could. So that's the third big change. In addition to that, we heard very clearly that people want to have a much more robust planning, reporting, and review system. So together with this document published on the same date, there was this uh, revised set of headline indicators, 38 of them. And, and that's going to be equally important in, in how we're going to be measuring those actions and how we're going to be reporting um, to the global community whether we're making progress or not in, in a relatively rapid uh, way. Great, thank you. Now, one of the targets in particular has been getting quite a lot of attention, um, and that's the target of protecting 30% of the land and sea by 2030. The, uh, Survival International, which is an organization working with indigenous peoples around the world, calls the land-based target the biggest land grab in history. And it says that as many as 300 million people could be displaced if, um, if their ancestral lands are turned into protected areas. So how will the global biodiversity framework ensure that those people are not harmed? And can we really rely on governments to protect the rights of uh, people who whether they're indigenous people or not, who live close to forests and nature, when we consider that in the five years to 2019, Global Witness has documented nearly a thousand murders of uh, land and environment defenders who've been protecting forests and other areas from extractive industries, and in some cases, state security forces. So uh, touching on a very, there is two parts to, to your question. So one is, is what is meant by uh, target tree. And, and, and clearly what we we're talking here is protection and conservation. And conservation talks about many, many different systems, including land that is used for productive purpose, but which do have a biological value. Now, what's the role of indigenous people in conservation? Uh, I think everybody would agree that uh, uh, indigenous people and local community are the number one stewards of uh, wild and undisturbed lands and have a key role to play. There is no doubt, and, and, and I can talk freely about the countries I'm coming from, Canada, that in the past, the way at, uh, the, the way at land protection was done, there was many mistakes done. And, and it took us in Canada decades to fix those mistakes. But yet you can see land protection and conservation as a way for reconciliation. And that's what we're trying to do here in Canada. 
uh, most of the new protection and conservation is done by indigenous people on their land using their own uh, their own way of doing it. So I think that those people uh, that are uh, asking those questions are asking some very real questions about what's the role of indigenous people in, in, the, in biodiversity conservation and in land conservation. Um, I would say perhaps the answer is not one of blocking a process to which I think generally speaking, indigenous people largely support the value of land and the way but how you do it and then seizing the opportunity to make that a positive action and not a negative one. That's what we're trying to do in the framework by using under target 21, the language of the UN declaration on the right of indigenous people word by word. So those are a direct copy from uh, article eight paragraph B and that was already agreed to by 140 parties. So that's probably is a good starting point. Um, there is the, the CBD is probably one of the convention or the UN body that, that give a, or that has a largest recognition and engagement of indigenous people at all level of its structure. Is it perfect? No. Is, it, is there a way to, to progress and make it better? Definitely. But let's recognize what we got and, and let's look at, uh, if you don't do target tree, where will we be in 10 years? What what will we be? So that's that's what we we got to look at as well. Thank you. Thanks, Basil. I've, I've got a question here from Barbara Fraser, who is uh, from the National Catholic Reporters. She says wealthy countries have fallen far short of the funding for climate change adaptation in low income and vulnerable countries. If they're not contributing money for climate change, how likely is it that they will contribute for biodiversity conservation? I we're always compared to, to climate change. And, and that's good because it's, uh, it's uh, give us uh, an impetus to do more. Uh, however, it's important to keep in mind that nature is an issue we can all relate, it, relate to uh, very readily. Even people that uh, are rejecting some of the science around climate change usually relate to nature, understand nature. So my, my sense is that it is a lot easier to talk to uh, budget treasury people about nature. And, and we have at our side, a very vast uh, agri-food business uh, talking about uh, the importance of investing in nature to protect their existence and, uh, and their, their role in prov providing food to people. So the, the relationship is very direct. Um, how we're gonna need to work, I, I think, uh, your, your, the question is also relating to the how developed countries are looking at the issues. And, and one of the, 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 the advantage that we have on nature is that direct relationship. So uh, if you're living in Europe, you have an interest in uh, making sure that there is um, proper habitat available for your migratory birds in the flyway. So you have kind of a north-south, very direct relationship and that exists around the world in terms of how we, we relate to each other. So some of the targets that are in the document describe a, a very different world to the one that we're living in today. So for example, all farming being sustainable, getting rid of all harmful subsidies and ensuring that all businesses, whether they're large or small, are assessing, reporting on and, and minimizing their impacts on biodiversity. That That is, a huge amount of change is it is it really realistic that that can be achieved in, in the space of a decade and if so, so what, what needs to happen yes for countries to translate these commitments uh, into national and subnational plans and policies and laws won't that alone take a lot of time so definitively if if you look at uh, uh, the global biodiversity outlook five that was published earlier there is a really interesting uh, look at the, the system change. And, and I think everybody, including the World Economic Forum, agree that there was massive change happening to the agri-food system, the extractive industries and infrastructure. Um, I think we have no doubt, no, we, we, it's relatively easy to convince people of the value of the result where we want to go out. So who would not want to have sustainable food industry, a, a more a more safe and secure food, 
uh, kind of a, 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 so describing the word we want is relatively easy and getting people to buy into that is relatively easy with the help of people like you in the news and in, in media. The challenge is the transition. How do you finance that huge change? And the good thing that we have going for us, it's, it's not like the climate change, uh, people telling the coal mining industry, like you got to stop and do something else. What we're telling the agriculture sector is we, we need you. We need more of you. We're going to need to feed more people, but we need you to do your job in a very different way. And, 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 and we're going to need to manage that transition from um, agriculture policy that support production to agriculture policy that support environmental services. So uh, very interested to see how the UK is going to do that. They're starting from blank sheet and they have an opportunity to exercise some leadership. So, and that's why all that incentive is so important. And that's why you don't know that, but we spend so much time talking to the World Bank and the IMF to so convincing environment minister sometimes is difficult, but so, you know we know them and we talk to them every day. Getting in in the agenda of finance minister is the real challenge. And and but I, I must report that I have, I'm having more and more of those discussion, and surprisingly enough, it is the private sector that is pushing that agenda, because they want to be they want to be successful as well, and they see a significant risk in providing financial resources to industries that may be facing, facing risk, that may not be around, that may not be competitive. So that's a very interesting and fast moving world. I've got another question here, Basil, from a journalist in India, Umika Swami, who's working for the Economic Times. She says, over the past few years, particularly due to the pandemic, there's been growing recognition that biodiversity loss ecosystem degradation, climate change, land degradation, pollution are issues that need to be addressed in a harmonized manner. Is that a view shared by the co-chairs of the uh, process that produced this draft? And how can that best be reflected in the uh, global biodiversity framework? So, so definitely, and I'll even extend the question a little bit further to, to other issues like the uh, climate change and health, the pandemics. Um, what I think is valuable is that at the, at the multilateral le level, we set a, a group of coherent targets and actions for climate change, for biodiversity, for health. The integration should be coming in at the implementation level. So if you're, if you're sitting at the local level and you have a project for restoration, that project may provide benefit for, for climate change in terms of carbon storage. But by using the right tree species, you may be also uh, restoring the land, the land from a biodiversity perspective, and you get a second benefit. And then at the same time, you may also, uh, may, you may be also uh, isolating some species from human dwellings, and you may also have a health aspect to it. So we, have, we will have a very, important piece of work on how we bring all those systems together, how we bring together the financing, the project review management and reporting, and, and how we make life easy for people on the ground that are actually providing the solution. So this document uh, is only a plan. What, what counts is how it's used and, and whether it creates change on the ground. And how will the framework uh, make sure that any of this actually happens? Is, th is there a mechanism for uh, holding parties to the, to the convention to account for um, what they've committed to? How is there a mechanism for increasing ambition? Does it have any teeth? Is there a dispute mechanism? So the, the, the starting point is the convention is, is a convention that works by consensus. And, and parties have obligation to, uh, to take on the action that they, they commit to in the plan. Um, there is no dispute mechanism. There is not the kind of uh, type of mechanism that we see in the Paris Agreement yet. However, we've not used to the fullest extent the capacity of the current agreement. And what, what is being proposed through the GBF under section J but also in the accompanying decision that will be coming out from the, the subsidiary body and implementation 
is to set up a much more robust planning, reporting, and the review system. And at the planning stage, there is two aspects to it. There is one stage, which is kind of evaluating the ambition. So we let's say that there is an agreement for a 30% protected and conservation target. Obviously, the contribution of the Netherlands or Singapore will be different than that of uh, Canada or China. So you need to be able to aggregate all that and see if it makes up for the 30% we're looking for. The second step after that, once you agreed and, and you've adjusted everything, so you get to the 30%, you said, okay, Singapore, you said you would be protecting 5% of your landscape. Have you actually done it? No judgment on Singapore, the great people. Or Canada, you said you would do 35 or 40%. Have you done it? So that's the second phase. And, and I think, frankly, uh, we have plenty of room to work within the, the constraint of the current system. If at the end of the period, there is a need to, to do more, then the parties will, can, will be able to consider that. I've got a, a, a pair of journalists who've asked a very similar question, which is related to, to this aspect of accountability and making sure that people uh, or parties to the CBD do what they say they're going to do. Uh, both of them have brought up the issue of um, plantations and uh, countries uh, claiming to in increase forest cover by using plantations, but not having biodiversity benefits. So this question comes from uh, somebody called Dash Vatsa and also Joydeep Gupta in India. Um, Joydeep says, we're regularly facing a situation where degraded forests, plantations and pastures are being shown as forests by governments to meet their targets. How does the Convention on Biological Diversity plan to address this? So, so there is the proposal in the current framework is, is in several, several places are, are looking at that. Primarily, if you look at the end of target eight, that, that uh, is very, very clear that mitigation adaptation effort should avoid all negative impact. So, so your plantation of, uh, of eucalyptus is not uh, biodiversity and has a negative impact. So that, that would not meet that criteria. The second one is in the target one, which is around the protection of intact and wild area. So uh, any kind of deforestation would be in contravention to, to that target. But I, the one of, I wanna, I wanna also uh, mention that uh, in the, in the uh, performance indicators that were released at the same time, we're looking also at a number of set of data. There is obviously primarily the report from the government, but increasingly we can we can we have a number of global source data in terms of remote sensing that help us verify that. So clearly, uh, it is relatively easy to see what is a plantation, what kind of uh, essence are being used in that plantation versus natural coverage. Great. There's a question from a journalist here called Nina Klein, uh, who says, uh, "Do you see that the Do you see the European Green Deal as being aligned with the draft biodiversity framework? And if not, what are the especially relevant topics that need to be addressed within the European Green Deal in order to achieve these goals?" So I haven't had a chance to, to uh, go back to the Green Deal since we closed the book on the, on the GBF, but, but I can tell you that there is a number of aspects of the Green Deal that are well aligned with the GBF. Uh, at, in places, I think the European Commission has been using slightly different definition, and that's quite all right. So the European Green Deal should be re relevant for the European region and each block and country will be evolving that global language to meet the, 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 the need. There is, what I would say too, is that the European Green Deal is one, one of the documents we'll be looking at. I was reading the other day, the European trade strategy and, and, the, and within that, how they're gonna be including biodiversity consideration in negotiation of trade agreement, which is a great, element, a very important element in terms of reaching what we're trying to do. Okay, so we are running short on time. So I'll, I'm going to just ask another couple of questions before we close, Basil. The, um, when we've been looking at climate change, we've seen how slow action has been and how little public awareness has been, but over time there's been growing public awareness of the climate crisis. 
but still not enough action on climate. Now compare that to biodiversity, it seems there's considerably less public awareness of the biodiversity crisis. So uh, what does the, the new framework say or uh, what will it commit parties to do to boost that public awareness so that people can really understand what the issues are and help uh, give the, the political pressure to governments and also the economic pressure on, on corporations, et cetera, to actually make these changes happen. That is true. And, and, and I was talking with uh, a, a pollster yesterday and, and we were talking about that notion of whether people are starting to confuse climate change with environmental issues and in the process forgetting about nature. Um, section K of the GBF is about outreach awareness and uptake, and, and definitely there is there is action to be taken on that side. I think it's it's uh, it's going to be incumbent on the, the international community and the negotiators to try to create a framework that is easier to to communicate and easier to understand by everybody. Um, let's not forget that. Uh, uh, nature is a lot easier to communicate than climate change. Everybody can relate to nature, whether you're living in a city or you're living in, in a very remote area. Um, we all know what nature is and what it does to us. Climate change is a much more uh, diffuse concept and harder to understand. So um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a real issue that, that uh, you've identified and, and definitely it's incumbent on, on all of us and particularly people involved in the media and communication to explain the relationship between the various issues, climate, nature, health, and then the importance of addressing all of them. So you cannot be successful in one and not on the other. You need to be successful in all of them in order to uh, progress. Thank you. And for, and for journalists who are interested in reporting on what happens next to the first draft of the Global Biodiversity Framework, can, can you just tell us a little bit about the, uh, the process? Because when you have your next negotiations, some of it is going to be watered down, some of it is going to be strengthened, and uh, there will be the introduction of what are called square brackets. Can you can you give us an insight into what those brackets mean? Yes. And, and also how journalists can uh, can look at the next document that comes out uh, so and understand that. Thanks. The, the, the good news for your community, community is that the biodiversity is one of the most open negotiation in the UN system. So no, no document is hidden or, or not available to the public. So you're going to have access to all the document just like any negotiator. And what's going to happen is you have a draft now that is out. There is a couple of companion document that will be coming out over the next few weeks. All that is going to be uh, discussed online in uh, plenary that are open to the public and contact groups that are not open. But uh, I'm sure you can talk to, to delegates and get some info. So basically, discussions are going to take place there. There will be a report from that. We're not going to try to get people to do negotiation in August. Negotiation online is very difficult. What we can do is exchange of views, explaining, I think this, you think that, I don't understand, and get to that point, okay, I get your point. I don't agree with it, but I get it. That's the point where we wanna get. And then in the, in the period from September to November, there will be further work. Maybe the, 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 the group will ask us to explore certain area, to say, okay, we don't understand the rationale between, be, behind this two third reduction can you dig a little bit deeper and, 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 and uh, come back? So we're going to do that work. They're gonna, probably going to continue to work together on refining some language. Then in January, we're going to come back together in face to face, and we're going to have further negotiation. By the end of those two, three weeks in January, we're going to be in a place where we're going to be probably preparing the final uh, document for the COP. And that final document may have what we call brackets, which is text that is not agreed to yet. And then clean text, which is text that has been agreed to with everybody. So brackets may, may have alternative. They may just be text that not everybody agreed to. And, and those will be brought to the last uh, negotiation opportunity, which is the conference of the party. At that point, the negotiators will have one last go at it. 
and, and in came ministers and higher level people, and they will, uh, they will have some conversation. And that's when you see those sessions that go late into the night, through the night sometime, with the idea of coming out with clean text at the end of the COP and, um, and an agreement that should be reached by the time uh, China uh, gavel the last bit of the text in, uh, in Kunming. I know, thank you very much, Basil. I think we're, we're almost out of time now. So I would just like to thank you for joining us at this early hour in the Canadian morning and for sharing your, uh, your knowledge of this vast topic. The, there are some journalists who ask questions that we didn't get to. Sorry, I couldn't get to all of them. I've also got a long list here that I wanted to ask you. So I might follow up with uh, by email Absolutely. And, uh, uh, and do that. Uh, anyone watching, thank you for joining the webinar. A recording of it will be available on the Earth Journalism Network website, which is earthjournalism.net. And we'll also send a follow up email uh, with a link to anybody who has been watching along today live. Don't forget to register on the Earth Journalism Network website if you'd like to learn about further opportunities and uh, to, to interact with other journalists through the network. Basil, thank you very much for uh, giving us this hour of your time today. And I look forward to hearing what comes next as the biodiversity framework continues to grow and evolve before the COP15 meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, you all are doing a very important part in the negotiation in terms of keeping people informed. So I look forward to read your stories and please don't be shy, contact me. Thank you, bye-bye now. Thank you.